So before I was in film and television, I worked as a journalist for about eight years in uh, various capacities. I was a music journalist for a little bit. I was a blogger for a little bit. Um, I was a White House reporter for a little bit, uh, doing political reporting. Uh, I was just kind of a jack of all trades in that industry. And then uh, I always sort of had an interest in film and TV and always thought that I might like to pursue screenwriting one day, but I didn't really have any idea how to break into the world. It's, you know, it can be... It can feel like there's a lot of obstacles to getting into entertainment if you're not in entertainment already. And so fortunately one day a, a guy named Mike O'Malley, uh, who was uh, the showrunner for this show called Survivor's Remorse that was based loosely on LeBron James's life, it was on Stars. he reached out to me and said that he'd read some of my journalism and said, uh, I think you might be good at TV writing, would you want to take a chance? And so uh, I did. I, I, I took my first TV job and then uh, I never looked back. I really, really loved it. I really loved the collaborative nature of it. Um, and I just went from there. When I read Erasure by Percival Everett, it, it resonated with me deeper than any piece of art ever had. Um, and I think that that was because, you know, it wasn't just because the professional themes of sort of the limitations that people put on black writers and, and creatives of color and sort of the limitations that people have about what our lives look like. Uh, it was also because there was a lot of family themes that were going on in the book that really uh, resonated with me. You know, the, the the book is about siblings and sort of, uh, you know, I have two siblings, Monk has two siblings, and, you know, the dynamic of those siblings sort of felt similar to my dynamic. Um, you know, the, the book has a, you know, I don't want to spoil it, but the book has issues with the mother that really sort of felt like issues that I had with my mother. Um, there was just all these kinds of overlaps between Monk's personal life and my personal life. And I think in order to sort of like make a really um, passionate adaptation that doesn't feel like bloodless, like you're just doing it um, by rote, you really need to find what speaks to you personally in the story. And so there was just a lot of it in the book that spoke to me personally and felt I felt like uh, really grounded and rooted in the story that, that gave me a way to, to find the courage to direct it because um, I think if I had been less passionate about the story, directing it would have been a much more difficult uh, prospect. This movie is about an author named Monk who uh, is not as successful as he believes he should be. And so one day he sets out to write a prank novel that he thinks is going to embarrass all of the people who publish novels into understanding um, why they don't like what Monk makes. And uh, he's not expecting that his prank is going to go uh, the way that it does. And uh, the prank book that he ends up writing becomes a massive bestseller. And, and while this is going on, he's got a lot of issues, uh, thorny issues in his personal life going on that also complicate his path. So it's about this big lie that he starts living and um, the speed with which that, uh, that lie picks up momentum and uh, sort of like the, the uh, sometimes hilarious, sometimes tragic consequences of that lie. Monk writes a book called My Pathology, that's uh, spelled P-A-F-O-L-O-G-Y. Um, and it is a send-up of all the kinds of um, very, very stereotypical black books and sort of like black stories. And it's about this young man who's living, uh, you know, in the projects and impregnating all these women and sort of living in this very stereotypical manner. And he writes it intending to sort of embarrass the people who publish novels and it ends up taking off and they end up loving it in a way that he was not expecting. Monk is bothered by the success of my pathology because he uh, feels like he's contributing to uh, the decline that he sees in sort of American culture. I think that it frustrates him that, that people aren't able to see uh, through, the, through the sort of ridiculousness of it, but I think it also frustrates him that he is uh, requiring the money that the book is providing. I think it puts him in this very difficult place. He's got, he's got things going on in his personal life for which he needs a lot of money all of a sudden. And I think that he's frustrated that he needs to sort of quote unquote sell out in order to sort of, uh, in order to make the money to, to, uh, to solve the problems in his professional life. And so I think on the one hand, he's frustrated that the book is becoming successful. But on the other hand, I think he's frustrated at himself that he seems to be participating in this, in this success. Monk is this kind of lovable grump, right? Monk is this kind of guy who, uh, who is pugnacious and argumentative and constantly battling with everybody in his life. And yet at the same time, you sort of see the hurt that's underneath that, that anger that sort of allows, you to, allows him to sort of ingratiate himself to you. You sort of see that this is a guy uh, 
who's in pain, and that's why he lashes out the way that he does. And I think that what Jeffrey brought to that character is it's difficult to play a lovable grump, right? Because um, if you err too far on the side of grump, then people can sort of not root for you because they think, well, this guy's a jerk. I don't care about him. And I think that the thing that Jeffrey does so well is does this balancing act between being a grump, but also sort of like earning your love and earning your respect and admiration along the way. You know, I think we all have these kinds of people in our life who are maybe pricklier than we are, and yet we love them because sort of like we see behind sort of that, that facade and sort of understand what's actually going on there besides just them being a jerk and rude. And so uh, Jeffrey just has this real authoritative voice and, and, and presence and sort of he feels very much like a college professor. He's sort of very intelligent. Um, he's very sort of thoughtful and very well read. He's a learned guy. And he's also very funny and sort of like he has this dynamic range that allows him to be dramatic and then hilarious within sort of like the drop of a hat. And so he was just the only person that I ever thought about starring in this movie when I decided to, decided to write it. I loved the script when I first read it. It was funny. It was laugh out loud funny. Not everything is. It's a very hard thing to do and I was really glad to uh, be the one he was talking to about playing Coraline, this lawyer who was newly divorced and was going to be the love interest to the lead, Jeffrey Monk, uh, Jeffrey Wright's Monk. That was a big deal, and uh, so I was glad. American fiction is about an author who doesn't seem to be making much progress in his career, and he's frustrated. He's frustrated because he can see others who he doesn't deem as talented or intellectual or working as hard being very successful. And so what is he willing to do to be popular? Because he doesn't feel like he can have impact if he's not popular. And so this is about that, but it's also about his life simultaneously falling apart and re making a whole sort of uh, a new version of himself. Monk is a curmudgeon. And he's also a brilliant writer and author. Um, he's a uh, son to a uh, woman, uh, his mother, who is having dementia and is failing. He's already lost his father previously. His brother has decided to have a meltdown and reevaluate who he is and in the world. And his, his sister is, is, um, hasn't taken care of herself as much as she needed to because she was taking care of the mother. And of course, she pays the price for that. Monk comes in at that point, and um, all this local weather, everybody has their different local weathers happening around him, and he can't remain in a silo, and he would like to be alone. <laughs> he probably would not like to deal with this, but he can't. Why Jeffrey Wright needs to be in this, and is perfect, is because he's a hammer. When you're trying to build something as big as this, and as delicately, you need somebody who's a hammer, and no one can say that Jeffrey Wright does not, is not only a great architect, but he's a great builder. Why is Monk bothered by the book's success? Because it's not who he is. He was doing it because he was angry. He was frustrated. He did it as, you know, uh, a, a, on a lark. And he can't imagine that doing something that took him a few evenings turns out to be more seriously entertained and um, uh, bedded than something that would take him months or years. He's not only frustrated, he can't believe that, but he's like, how did this thing that was in me suddenly become me. That's freaky. So Leslie Uggams plays Agnes, his mother, and she's uh, failing, her health is failing, she's having dementia. She also has two sons that are need her very much to be herself and she can't be there for him, them in that way, but they also um, need to take care of her now. She's the caretaker and now they have to take care of their mother. That's gonna be difficult. She's played wonderfully by the great Leslie Uggams, who has been in this business for over 75 years. Had her own show on CBS, everything. She gets her flowers in this movie. Cora Jefferson is a genius for casting her, but um, it just shows us how many great pioneers and true icons are still among us and able to work, so I'm glad for her. Uh, Tracy Ellis Ross plays Lisa, and Lisa is his sister. She's a doctor, and she's been taking care of the mother for a long time, and she, it's taken our burden on her. And so we see what it does to her. And the relationship between her and Monk is actually a beautiful one. They're great brother and sister, and she understands her brother, but she's also been overwhelmed. Sterling K. Brown plays Cliff. Cliff is um, a hot mess right now. Um, he's a doctor. 
So that means he's very disciplined and accomplished a lot in his life. But he's not feeling himself right now either. And um, he's experimenting. He, it's not that he doesn't know who he is. He doesn't think he's been allowed to be who he really is. And it's taken a toll on him. And right now he's angry. And like the, uh, the zeal of the convert, everyone is in his sights. He's taking it out on everyone. But he's just trying to explore who he is and give himself permission to do it. Court Jefferson, superpower and strength is his ability to be honest and vulnerable, but also confident all at the same time. And if you look at him, he stands like the captain on a ship or even like a dancer. He stands in second position and he even puts his hand behind his back. He was there filming and Gucci slip-ons on the beach. And I kept looking at his feet like, I can't believe he's about to ruin them shoes. I even said something, but he didn't care. He was there with a black trench coat and looking like he was looking into the future. And yet you could see that he wasn't sure how to get there, but he knew he had a good crew, not just around him filmmaking wise, but also cast as well. He knew he had, he had created a sound ship. Percival Everett wrote something that not only inspired him, that created the catalyst for him to expand his skill set. He was a writer, accomplished with awards, and he wants to be a director. And I think not only did he pull it off, he pulled it off without having to serve up a false version of himself. You could see that he was anxious to do well. He didn't hide that, and everybody wanted him to do well. So it's fantastic. I call him Cap now. That's the captain. The themes are identity, love, relationship, power, loss, grief, and who gets to be American and how. It is beautiful that we talk about the lead character having to create a false version of himself in order to be successful and how it splits him in half and he has to be one thing to one group of people and remain one thing to another. And he can't do it, he can't keep it up. At one point, the two are going to have to meet, but how and when? And um, what has he lost? What kind of, does he, does he still have integrity? Can he have integrity with that? He has a conversation that's great with Centara, with Issa Rae's, Issa Rae's um, uh, character about it. And it's a beautiful conversation. It's perhaps the thing that should be the, the, the theme and the, the, um, the linchpin of the entire film rest on their conversation. I hope audience experience joy. I hope they smile and I, they laugh. I hope they talk about things. I, I think that that's why he wrote it. I think that's why everybody came together, that they want to be a part of something that was significant, but also do a good job in something that made them laugh. I, it made me laugh, so I hope that people understand it's a generational dramedy and comedy, um, and that we've been having this conversation for quite some time, and I'm glad he's taking this on, and um, if they're there, we're asking them to be in this conversation with us together. This film is a film for everyone because comedy is a, is it transcends. And um, not, not every drama can say that, but usually if it makes you laugh, uh, there's a lot of people who can enjoy that. I also think it's called American fiction because it's an American story. It's not called black fiction. It's called American fiction. It's an American story. Who gets to be an American? For black people to start to embrace their, the idea of America being something that is uniquely them, because uh, we not only help build it, our, our blood and sweat and our tears are in the soil, and yet we often don't feel that we are the patriots, and we are. And we should say that it's also the uh, debut of a new American master, Cord Jefferson, and that's American fiction. So I think it takes a category and leaves it in a space where it can grow, but it also claims it, and I think um, that's a really powerful place for us all to be in. The script was sharply drawn, was funny, uh, ironic. It was, you know, Monk, you know, I, I appreciated Monk's tone. Uh, you know, his, 
his his tone you know expresses his frustration and, and sometimes his disdain for the world around him so there's a, a wonderful kind of sarcasm you know to his voice and uh, and he was a character who who used language as a writer you know as a tool and I, I appreciate those characters he also was one who was facing challenges not only creative challenges but challenges uh, related to family and that drew me in particularly his relationship with his mother was something that just struck a, a deep chord with me I could um, I knew it perhaps too well um, there were there were so many elements to this that uh, that resonated with me uh, and I I sensed too that could resonate with uh, with an audience you know and I, I think um, I think audiences are going to be pleasantly surprised based on what they know of the film when they see the film um, in that they're going to find themselves in elements of this story in unexpected ways. The movie is about a guy named Monk, Thelonious Ellison, nicknamed Monk after the, the brilliant uh, genius uh, jazz composer and pianist Thelonious Monk. And Monk is a writer. He, he's, he's, you know, he's a pretty obscure guy, though, in his writing. He, he's, he's free intellectually. He's got interests of his own. He's nonconformist. And he choose, chooses to write about those things, except the problem is that people don't necessarily want to read uh, his, uh, his books in numbers that would, uh, you know, that would make him uh, a greater success. So he comes home to Boston to his family for a book show. And at that book show, he dis discovers a, a writer named Centara uh, Golden, played by uh, the wonderful Issa Rae. And she's written a book that Monk, I think, feels, because he's fairly arrogant and sanctimonious, he thinks is beneath him. And yet this book is wildly successful. It's, you know, a, you know, it's a, a book for the masses. And Monk, out of frustration, decides it's a joke to write his own book for the masses uh, under a, a pseudonym, under the name Stag R. Lee. He does it out of spite, but lo and behold, the book is a wild success, the most successful book that he's ever written. And he is now forced to play uh, these two roles, these two dual identities, one himself and one this character, you know, with his, ver his version of street cred named Stag R. Lee. Meanwhile, his family is crumbling. His mother is ailing, and he's asked to be the adult in the room and take responsibility uh, for her as she had once for him. And so these things clash, and uh, it's a story about his journey through that and about the sacrifices that he's asked to make on behalf of love and family and on, uh, you know, his... Uh, uh, his reconciling uh, with his own voice, his own creative and intellectual place in the world and, uh, and the world as it is. It's, uh, there's a lot there. There's a whole lot there. You'll laugh, you'll cry. Ideally, you'll want more. Monk writes a book called My Pathology, which he later renames Again Out of Spite, Fuck. Uh, you know, he's a marketing genius as well as a talented writer. Monk is irritated by the success of the book because he wrote it as a means of, of, uh, that's a very good question actually. It's a very good question. Because in fact, perhaps he shouldn't be surprised at its success. He writes it to emulate a book that's wildly successful. But he writes it from a point of view of disgust and anger. So in some ways, he's not surprised, but he's, he's disappointed. He's disappointed, rather, because it's uh, more of an indication of his own isolation as an, as an artist and as an intellectual. Um, 
So perhaps he's not so surprised, but he's certainly, uh, he's certainly angered by it. Monk is, uh, is a writer. Uh, in the book that the film is based on, there are these wonderful moments that are almost like spells where Monk describes these interests that he has in, in fly fishing, in, in, in woodworking. And they're so beautiful, they're so quiet and meditative, and they have nothing to do with what perhaps uh, mainstream expectations are for a man such as him. And I think they, they, they really, that, that's who he is. He's a guy who is his own man, who's his own artist, a writer, who's not interested in conforming, but is interested in being free. Um, and it's about the world's resistance to his freedom, and it's about the ways that resistance uh, inform his personality, his frustrations, and his isolation. Um, he's also a, bit, a little bit of the boy with, the, with his thumb in the dike, uh, the dike being uh, his family. Um, so they're all, you know, there are a number of pressures on him from, from the beginning of the film to the end that he has to contend with, and we, uh, we go along with him on his journey uh, to see whether or not he'll survive, and if he does survive, you know, how and with what intact. Well, Cord brought everything to the film. Uh, this film is, is not without Cord's vision, his hard work, his wonderful work, and his tenacity. Um, he adapted this novel from Percival Everett's uh, uh, book uh, Erasure, and when you know no one else had interest in that, and uh, that takes uh, you know that takes some force, and it takes um, some foresight. I mean, he knew that this story wanted to be told, and he also knew that the story wanted to be heard and seen, uh, which is pretty pretty wonderful and pretty. Uh, Pretty, pretty nice gift for all of us who are part of it. And he's, um, you know, he's a first time director, and we recognize that, but he wrote a script that had so much information in it for us as actors that it almost served as a co-director. When Cord was on set, I never really had a question of his, uh, to him, uh, you know, as to what anything meant, because it was so clear. I also understood this character in a very intimate way, like, Cord did. I found a lot of overlaps between my life, but it was never a question of what do you mean, but rather it was how do you want to tell this? How do you, how do you, how do you want, you know, what's your vision for the tone? How do you want us to tell this story? Because we are with you and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be the lead blocker for you, you know, because, you know, he's, you know, he's inexperienced on a set, but he's a wonderful communicator, uh, had a crystal clear vision, and he's, uh, you know, he's a really generous leader, and so, you know, we we we, you know, we were the lead blocker, and he, uh, you know, he just uh, charged in, and led us all, uh, you know, cast and crew, um, down the field with this thing, and uh, and we we had a sense when working on it that we might be making something pretty good, might be making something special, but it all comes down to Cord's uh, vision and leadership. The film explores themes around race, identity, culture, and perceptions of those things and representations of those things in mainstream media. But it also explores more elemental and universal themes around love, family, personal isolation, personal, personal responsibility. Um, and I think those things uh, balance one another beautifully in our film. And I think they open a wide door for the audience to step inside uh, and perhaps find themselves, no matter their background, uh, find themselves inside this world. And, and maybe find a bit of home here and there. Um, I, 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 I'm really excited about that. I'm excited that 
uh, people may unexpectedly uh, find something familiar and, and, and comforting in this, in this film. Uh, people from, you know, whether they be from, you know, Boston, New York City, Los Angeles, you know, Arkansas, uh, uh, Missouri, you know, the UK or Germany, you know. Uh, I think there's something in here that, that, uh, that strikes a very human chord. Um, I was enamored from the first uh, couple of pages. I was yeah. already hooked, I was already in, and it was a page turner script. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was so beautifully written that it didn't feel, it felt like reading a book. Uh, versus reading a script hmm. um, and all each of the characters felt so full uh, I also had never read a story like this um, I was grateful that I hadn't read the book because it gave me fresh eyes to read the script and sort of respond to it like that what I was excited about in terms of Lisa is that first and foremost she was a Planned Parenthood doctor and that in and of itself and to bring her to screen um, felt important to me, especially in the dynamics of this family yeah. and as a black woman um, in this day and age. Also, um, her role in the family and the fact that she was doing all things for all people selflessly um, and filling in all the gaps and all the uh, spaces that no one else was um, holding reminded me of so many black women in the world and I felt like it was an important space um, to share. Yeah. Nice. Uh, me. Let's see. I think the first thing that sort of got me is like, so we, we want to, they're offering you this movie, it's called Fuck. Yeah, that, I think that also got And I was us. like, what's it I'm called? I'm sorry, what now? <laughs> and I was like, well, let me, let me see what this is all about, right? So I was reading it, and I was like, fuck. <laughs> fuck. You know what I'm saying? Like, each page. I was like, and. It was us, it was black folks being seen in a way that we don't tend to get seen on mm -hmm. the big screen. Um, it made me laugh from beginning to end. Yeah. Um, it was, it felt like an opportunity. I, similar to how I felt when I first read Black Panther. Mm. I was like, I feel like this is something, a, a moment in the culture that things could shift, mm. right? And I was like, how can I be a part of that? Because Cliff was a, a great part and, and people were trying to tell me, they're like, well, maybe you want something bigger or whatnot. And I was like, no, I, there's nothing small about him. The screen time may be whatever it is, but he's important. And he is so different than what people are accustomed to seeing me do. And someone is offering to see me, right, in another way that I felt honored to have been asked. There's also knowing that Jeffrey Wright was attached oh, that, to it. Oh, that definitely was a big draw. You know, we had <laughs> Issa and Tracy and Erica and just like a marvelous cast of human beings whose work I have appreciated for a long time. Uh, not enough times, I feel, do you get a chance to see an ensemble pop because ego tends to get in the way of like, what's the billing or what's this? I was like, I just want all the dope people to come together and make something that's beautiful. Because it used to be like that more when we were younger. There would be these wonderful like mm -hmm. ensembles. I want to bring that shit back. Yeah, I have to say that the, um, this idea, I remember hearing this early on in my career, there's no such thing as a small role, yeah. um, only small actors. And um, it also has to do with the material though. Yeah. You know, yes, you can inhabit something and breathe life into it and give it something big, but, and I really, Cord did an incredible job of writing female characters as full human beings yeah. um, that have their own point of view, their own lives. You know what's happening off screen by how they appear on screen. Right. And, uh, and it was a joy, even though there was limited time um, on screen for me to fall into that. The title of the book is My Pathology. Path. Pathology. Pathology. My pathology. Path. My pathology. Ology. Because he's so frustrated with what he considers to be consumable for a white audience regarding the black experience, right? And it oftentimes tends to be things that suffer or that, that focus on our suffering, right? Um, and he's saying that it sort of diminishes the birth of our experience and that when white folks tell stories about suffering, 
Nobody equates that story with the totality of their existence. Whereas our stories, we don't get as many opportunities, so they think that's all of who we are. Right? And it's all that is expected Boom. or wanted from yeah. us. So in a fit of like anger, he's like, all right, I'm going to show you. If you want suffering, I'm going to show you suffering. And by the way, it's a great scene. Keith David and, was, and Oak. First of all, also that, yes, on the page, but the way that was done Ooh. elevated that to an entirely other level. I was like, oh, 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 I did not know this was going to be done I'm like I'm going to give you another one. Get this. I heard he had like some sort of eye infection, and that's why there's an eye patch. Oh, that's brilliant. You know what I'm saying? I was like, I would, I could not have seen it any other way. Oh, no, the, it was so brilliant. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. No, it, oh. <laughs> First of all, the, this movie is filled with so many different perfect moments that yeah. you could lift it out and you would be like, that's amazing. It's own thing. And then, yeah. but it's all strung together and woven together in this beautiful cinematic yeah. way yeah. that, I, I don't know, he, he hit a perfect pitch. Agreed. Agreed. I think there's a, um, it's a universal family story. Absolutely. Um, of the dynamics between siblings and um, aging parents. Uh well, one aging parent. Yeah. Um, it's also a story about a man navigating how he sees himself versus how the world sees him. Yeah. Um, and I think those are really universal uh, topics that all of us are trying to make sense of. Uh, so although this is specifically the story of a black man and how he is navigating that, yeah. everybody can identify because we're all trying to figure out how do we be ourselves versus what the world wants from us. I also think there is a thoughtful and hilarious critique of the industry yeah. in terms of what stories they're willing to see black people in. And I think if this movie is successful, right, I think it sort of opens the door of saying that like, not only are we looking for specific stories that have a universal appeal for everyone, but these stories make money. Because mm. if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. Because it's a business. Come on now. Hollywood is a business. You know, it ain't show art. Mm -hmm. No, it's show biz. Show biz. Mm -hmm.